First World Order Radio, final lead, final lead. We are on the air, no doubt. All right, all right. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. We get on into some of that order consciousness tonight. First World Order Radio every Wednesday, 8 p.m. We got to talk about what is taking place on the planet. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. First, we need to let you know we're going to be doing more shows, giving out more information on Wednesdays. Wednesday is 8 o'clock. We are now going to make this the hottest day of the week. Proceeding in others in time, order, and importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence, an indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same that your thoughts transmits it. Burn. Proceeding others in time, order, importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Burn. Earthly state of human concerns in existence, an indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. Burn. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Burn. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. You need to understand how magical this, uh, something like this every Wednesday can become. So you need to start uh, getting your calendar right, get your schedule, your schedule right. You need to know our intention straight out. All right, so, I mean, these clues are given throughout the various languages was to piece the puzzle of this ancient mystery school back together again. And what we plan on doing, both of us, is bringing y'all some surefire dynamite. We're going to take this level up a notch. We're going to have stuff to do here. This is not just going to be about philosophies and theories and shit that works. Peace, peace. Back once again with Dr. Aleem El Bay's show. All right, tonight's discussion is going to be on the African origin of martial arts. And we say in African because um, not just the people, but also the mind. Um, my African mind um, utilizing the energy in which that comes from, the Kundalini energy in which that hits the area of the brain first, which is the reptilian portion, also known as the brain stem. Um, up from the spinal column to 33 degrees or 33 vertebrates, as they would say, in which that is all symbolic um, to the death of one of the lower self, which that's what the brainstem or the reptilian portion of the brain symbolizes, um, that Judas uh, factor within each and every one of us, that double-mindedness. You have a lower mind and you have a higher mind. The neocortex in the frontal lobe symbolizes the higher mind while the reptilian brainstem symbolizes the lower mind. Um, and, of course, the, um, the limbic brain, the medulla oblongata, you know, and um, you know those portions of the brain, the temporal lobes, um, all of that sits um, in the center or symbolizes the moving up of that energy through the various brain areas. So what we're going to talk about tonight is the origin of martial arts. Now, when we get into it, um, we have to go back to um, where the information is found at. But before we get to the information, let's get to the people. For example, um, there was a study in which that was done um, on the genealogy of Asians, in which that they say that the ancient black Chinese is from East Africa, and this was a um, this was the genetic test done by Professor Jin Lee, in which that he says that the Chinese came from Africa, just like the rest of us. And this this was posted Thursday, uh, May twelfth, two thousand and five, from Hong Kong. An international study has found that the Chinese people originated not from the Peking man in northern China, but from early humans in East Africa who moved through South Asia to China some 100,000 years ago. 
um, Hong Kong's Ming Pao Daily reports yesterday in the findings that confirms the single origin theory in anthropology. Now, who are the people that they are saying that they come from? Well, we have the Kong people. Now, when you look at the Kong people, the eyelids of the Kong people and the Chinese um, or Orient, or Orientals, or or the Asians, or nearly identical, and the Kong people, or who we refer to now as the Bush people, or the Bushmen um, people, um, living in the Kalahari Desert, and um, Nambia, and Botswana, and Angola, all right? Um, Now, they are the people in which that originated, um, the Asians, but they also was on the, now they are in the northern central part of Africa, but they was once in the east eastern portion of Africa in which that this information is still found on the temple walls. Uh, matter of fact, if you go to J. Rogers' um, Sex and Race book, Volume 1, he shows a picture of a um, Central African and an um, Asian man. Um, and it looks, they they are nearly identical. The nose, the broad nose, the lips, the eyelids, nearly everything. All right, if you go to um, the book, I think it was called What They Never Told You in History by Endokimic Kush, um, he has a picture of the Mexican and the Kao um, Nuba people of the present-day um, Sudan. Um, and how they look identical to the Omec people. Now, we know that the Omecs um, are the Shang Dynasty. They're the people of the Shang Dynasty. Um, they're related to um, the people from out of Nigeria, um, particularly the Igbo, in which that, um, and the Yoruba, or the Europa, all right, um, in which that the Europa to even today still acknowledge Shango, well, the first dynasty of um, China was the Shang Dynasty, in which that was short for Shango. And you will find, actually, that the Omecs, or known as the Xi people, um, actually were the builders of the Xi'an providence with those pyramids in China are still located at now, and even the Asian people say that they did not build them because these came from the Xi people, known originally as the Omex, from the Shang Dynasty. Um, these are the same people, the um, Kaunuba people from out of the Sudan. And matter of fact, their mandate even today is required that every young man enter into the Montu um, arts or what is called martial arts training. Okay? Um, there's an article. It's called the BKF Magazine. It was dated July 1999 and was revised July 1st, 2000. And I had both issues in which that was by um, Brother Nigel and... He writes on Nuba Wrestling, The African Origin of Martial Arts Revealed by Nigel BPG. Now, he states that the Nuba, or the Nubians, or um, um, now the um, linguistically uh, Nuwapian, um, the Nubians of Sudan, or the Nuba of New Sudan, um, African practice a form of martial arts, wrestling, over 2,800 years before Christ. There are no records in any corner of the world that can claim such a long and unbroken martial arts tradition. All right, this form of martial arts, which include weapons as well as um, fortification and certainly empty hand self-defense, blossom in the 12th dynasty Egypt. All right, uh, all right, or what we call Tamari or Tamare. 
Now, Nuba Wrestling is the original martial arts or Montu arts, and we'll get into the Montu explanation of that in a second, that all of Africa, Asia, and Europe later came to benefit from. Now, all present-day scholars of what is commonly known as the Greco-Roman wrestling um, attribute the origin of their sports to illustrations discovered on the walls of the tombs at the region of ancient Egypt or Tamare or Tamari or Kamal or Kemet um, called Mahin. Now, the Mahin, which is um, also been renamed Beni Hassan or the Hill of the Sun of the Hassan family, beautiful family, um, although considered just a sport today, these illustrations point to a well-developed science that actually developed in Nuba or Nubia, but reached the zenith of expression in Egypt, all right, or to marry. Now, what they also found that at um, the Ben Hassan, in the four separate tombs, there are hundreds of paintings on the um, limestone walls that for the most part has been decayed. The paintings are of African martial arts using a variety of wrestling holes and locks. The illustration total well over 500 individual pairs of wrestlers who are executing hundreds of sophisticated techniques such as um, open-hand combat, various styles, um, hand combat blocks, kicks, throws, grappling techniques. Now, these images are mainly recorded in the tomb of the governors or prince by the name of Baki the Third and his son Kati and his son Amenhet, and they are all reigned in the Mahes during the 11th and the 12th dynasty. So these illustrations was all found. Um, in the well-known tomb of Prince Kadamit Hotep. Right, so the paintings features pairs of um, fighters who are wrestling, as well as illustrations of warriors using other forms of unarmed, unarmed combat that employ kicking and punching techniques. There are scenes of martial arts using weapons such as lance, short sticks, daggers, staffs, and bows and arrows. There are even scenes of warriors utilizing military technology, um, such as um, Tessido, which is a shielding de um, defense used during the um, siege of a castle. Now, the earliest representation of a castle in the world can be found illustrated on an incident holder that originated from Nubia, the mother civilization of Egypt, all right, or Kemet, Tamaray. Now, several paintings of the castles in the Mahes tombs predate what we believe about the birth of castles, fortification, and medieval technology from Europe's Middle Age. All total, these um, paintings in Africa represent the most ancient and prolific depictions of martial arts on Earth. All right? So, this is what we have to come to the understanding of. And like we said, um, you can get that issue of the BKF, which is the Black Karate Federation magazine, in which that has what is called Nuba Wrestling, um, African origin of the martial arts. You can get that issue dated once again, um, July 1999, and it was revised July the 1st, 2000, and it was written by um, Nigel B.P.G. Now, they also found um, Nubian wrestling or martial arts called Montu. Now, Montu was the actual name of this particular art because Mon actually is the, is the same deity as Min. Now, Min symbolized the fertility deity. Now, the genitals are um, actually controlled by the reptilian portion of the brain. The root chakra, base chakra, is controlled by that. Now, the reptilian portion of the brain works off of fight and flight. All right? Fight 
and flight. So it deals with survival. Right, so Mon too symbolizes the warrior deity, in which that, of course, um, within the Greek mythology becomes um, Ares and Mars. You know, Greco-Roman mythology becomes Ares and Mars. Um, but there's a picture that is found on the Temple of the Ramesses the Third, also in uh, the Medinet um, Habu, and it goes further back than what I just finished talking about, which is 28. Hundred years. This goes back thirty-one um, hundred years old. Um, um, there is older, and that is older than the East Asian martial arts, which are only just about twenty-two thousand years old, by the way. So this goes back almost nearly over a thousand years more using these martial arts, and actually you would see um, them on the walls using short sticks, um, blocks, stance, um, slams, throws, grappling effects, so forth and so on. Now, to even verify this even further, um, you would get a book that was published in 1958. Uh, it was called What is Karate? And it was published basically by, written by South Korean grandmaster Masu uh, Tasu Oyama, um, who was born like around 1923, and I think he died in 1994. But he's the acclaimed um, founder of um, Keio Kushin Kai, um, which is Japanese for the Society of the Ultimate Truth. Um, he was a master of uh, Shotokan and Goju Ru also. But um, in his book, What is Karate, he states that the oldest record were um, the oldest records we have found concerning or concerns unarmed combat on hieroglyphics or on hieroglyphics from the Egyptian pyramids. Location at the Benin Hassan. Now, some believe that. Um, now, if you see the picture on his book, you will see him with his left foot forward and his hands up in like the cop position, calming spirit. And the hands are turned open, so hence the term for karate, open hands, um, which we'll get into that in a second. But the same stance, he shows a picture coming right off the walls of the Benin Hassan, off of that location, the hieroglyphics. And basically, that stance supposedly means I have no weapons. However, in the traditions of the ancient Temerian um, or Kemet's or Egyptians, of course, we know that the left foot forward was symbolic of truthfulness and the intent of the heart, because the heart is on the left side of the body, which means to go forward with righteousness and trample down evil. Now, of course, we know the Western military emphasizes stepping out on the left foot first. Your left, your left, your left, right, left. So they love that, all right? This came from out of ancient Egypt. Now, the left also symbolizes the left side of the brain, which is logical. It deals with sequences, um, rational, analytical, and is objective. Now, the hands raised symbolizes the, um, like I said earlier, the metuneta or the hieroglyphic of ka, which means spirit. So the hands are the extension of the heart. This is what this symbolizes. So, um, in other words, I come in peace. However, if you mess with me, I will stomp a mud hole in your behind. Um, basically, that's what that symbolizes, all right? Um you know, in English transliteration of the hieroglyphics. Now, so when you get his book, I think, I think it's, I think it was another name um, before that, but I think it's where is karate, um, what is karate um, now? All right. Now we spoke about um, Prince um, Amenhet. Now Amenhet also was known um, as Amini, and which means, you know, Amen is supreme. And he was the prince and the governor of Menhes um, during the 11th, 12th dynasty. 
and he, um and as a high official in the court of the king, um, Usir, um, Sin, the first, he was known as the great chief of Menhez. Now he ruled for twenty five years, um, from the time of um Usir, um Usir, Sin, the first, to the reign of King um Amenhet the second. All right, of the twelfth dynasty, and who was the author of the famous testament of um Amenhet that can be found in the Melogen papyrus and the papyrus um Cellier, um the second it is the world's first statement about the duty of a king, and it was a document that showed that clearly defined royal obligations based upon the needs of the people all right Amenhet. Um, the first made a point of stating that a ruler must be willing to endure personal sacrifice and loneliness because he was a servant of the people. The people was not his servant, so there was no dictatorship, all right, as we would think, in which that goes on within a um, a so-called rule by royalty, as we would say. That was not the original way in which that it was set up, definitely not coming from Kush or um, what is now called Sudan or Anuga, and definitely was not within um, Egypt or Tamare or Kemet, all right? So, but on the temple walls of this temple up under Prince um, Amenhet, you will see glyphs, metunatas of Nuba wrestlers, and you would see not just boats, so it shows that we was navigators, masters of the seven seas, but you would see uh, once again, like judo holes, everything that we do, that is done within judo is done on this wall. Um, you'll see the bows and the arrows, the particular weapons, as we spoke about earlier, the short stick, long sticks, um, particular um other weapons, um, you will see particular grappling holes, um, slams, as we call it nowadays, a lot of wrestling moves that you might see on TNA, as well as also on um, WWE, all right? Um, all of this is on the walls of that particular temple of um, I'm in a hat. Now, the earliest representation of any kind of a belt associated with the martial arts is also found in Tamare or Tamari, along the banks of the Nile, and the tombs belonging to Prince Kati and Prince uh, Baket, the third of the 11th and 12th dynasties, which dates back around 2800 B.C. Now, in both tombs, there are two pairs of warriors facing each other, in the example from Prince Kati's tomb, the warrior stands with his left foot and outstretched arms, in particular his left arm was out forward. From his left hand, um, you would see a belt in the form of a rope dangling to the floor. This rope does not fall naturally into um, just one strand as they do nowadays. So the original black belt was not one strand. It's actually this here was two strands. So this symbolized the elliptical pattern of of DNA, the elliptical pattern of energy, all right? And this belt is interwoven. It is not simply a rope. It is the symbol of what we call shin, all right? Now, the word shin within Tamari or Tamare, Egypt, Kemet, and the Orient, China, Japan, both the word Shin means the exact same thing, which means spirit. That's no coincidence. That word was kept within both languages. Now, Shin, which is like a coil rope, used to represent interwoven bioelectrical, magnetic, and spiritual polarities or opposites. This is where the symbol of the yin and yang or the yin and yang comes from within the Orient. 
Now, the opponent facing him is tying the rope around his waist. The tying of this rope is at the second chakra and was a symbolic act meaning to remind the students that training was for the purpose of developing the kundalini or the spiritual life force from its lowest to its highest point along the spine. It is also the storage place of this electromagnetic energy called prana, chi, ki, energy. All right? So the navel or right below the navel called your lower dantian, which is the lower heaven, symbolizes the storage place of this electromagnetic energy. And the belt symbolizes that. Okay? This is where the black belt comes from. This is why the black belt is still today used as the highest belt within karate and certain other styles of martial arts. Because it symbolizes your genes. It also symbolizes the electromagnetic um, pulse energy that raises up from the base root chakra known as your sacral bone area up the spinal column, all 33 vertebrates to enter into the kingdom of God. Also referred to as the Garden of Eden. Also referred to as the abode of Allah. Also referred to as the Cave of Brahma. Called many names throughout the various religions, but this is what this is all symbolic to. This is metaphysics and esoteric teachings at its best. While many teachers have you looking outside of yourself, it is required that you look inside in order to find your Lord and personal Savior, your God, your higher self. For greater within he that is in you than he that is in the world. So, in ancient um, Tamaria, Tamari, Kemet, Egypt, the belts had nothing to do with rank and achievement in the outward sense. This is where it's been twisted at. The true meaning of the belt is lost today among practitioners of the so-called martial arts who have actually reversed the original intent and used the belt to focus on the lower nature of ego instead of a higher nature which leads to enlightenment. This is what is going on. So you have um, the backbone of Osiris, which symbolizes the spinal column, also referred to as the digid which also where the term Jedi comes from within the um, Star Wars sagas or trilogies. Um, the Jijid symbolizes the master, the fire of the back, the life-giving fire. Um, so you become all saw once you master that fire. And that fire is the serpentine fire referred to as the Kunda or the Kundalini, which means serpentine fire. And that energy um, is worked up. So martial arts just isn't about self-defense as far as um, particular fighting style with blocks, kicks. That is something in which that is for protection if needed to protect from harm when needed. However, the ultimate goal of martial arts is the development of your spiritual self. And this information is lost nowadays because a lot of practitioners who teach martial arts are Christians, and they are trying to come from it, a Christian perspective using ancient information in which that most of them believe that just comes from the Orient, and they have no information or knowledge concerning what we are going over tonight. And so um, the students are lost, especially the melanated students, who are the modern-day Tamarians or Tamarians or Kamals, Kemets, Egyptians, Kometians, as they also refer to us. I like to use the word Kamal and Tamarian. Now, These children are suffering, as well as the adults, from 
from not knowing this information. And like we said, a lot of the focus has now been placed on something external, which is just simply getting a belt, starting at the white belt and ending at the black belt and going through the various mastering of the black belt, um, one through ten, um, mastery of the black belt. So you become a black, a first-degree black belt, and then you can go to a tenth-degree black belt. Okay? And possibly even higher in some systems. Um, my teacher... Grandmaster Sun Yadisea Swati is a 10th degree um, Dan um, Black Sash. So um, he is one of the grandmasters of martial arts. And the information which that he teaches us is what I'm presenting to you tonight. And this is what we have to get a greater understanding of, overstanding of. And for those that don't understand what we're talking about historically, let's go back um, even further. Let's get a little bit more specific. Because um, in 520 A.D., a monk named Bodhidharma left um, southern India. Now, Bodhidharma was actually from the Tamil people. All right, The Tamil people came from out of the interior of Egypt. All right, The word Tamil actually is the word Atum Ray. It was the followers of Atum Ray, the Tamil people. And they went into India, southern India. This is where they get the term Hindu Kush from. They was Kushites. These were the same people, the Sudanese, um, the Nubians, as we now refer to them as moderately. But they kept the culture in which that was taught in these martial arts systems. In particular, the culture was what now is known as yoga within the Sanskrit or yoga in which that means union, which symbolizes the union of the Setian force and the Heru force, or um, self. All right, Set symbolizes the lower self, the lower mind, and Heru symbolizes the higher self, the higher mind. And both natures, the lower nature, higher nature, must merge to become one self. This is what this great battle symbolizes, and it's that was explained over and over again throughout the Bible. You had Cain and Abel. Cain symbolizes the sentient force, the lower self. Abel symbolizes the higher self. Then you had it again with Jacob and Esau. Jacob symbolizes the supplanter, the lower self, who had to ascend to his higher self. So he changed the name to Israel, which symbolized also Esau. We get the word later on um, within Arabic Esau which becomes the name of Jesus. This is all the transliterations of what we're talking about here. So it symbolizes the higher self. This is Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, all related languages, Semitic languages. If you don't know it, then you need to do more research and study. This is what this requires. The story is told again with Jesus and Judas. Once again, two brothers in which that Judas betrayed Jesus. Symbolizes once Judas symbolizes the lower self, and Jesus symbolizes the higher self. This, these stories come back from the old ancient tale of Set and Heru, the battle of Set and Heru, in which that is told within uh, the Perhem Heru text, or the Perhem Heru Sut text, Coming forth by day and by night. Misnomer by um, Wallace, e. But Wallace A. Butch as um, E.A. Wallace Butch. Um, he misnomered it and called it the Book of the Dead. But Bodhidharma was put from the Tamil. He was a Kushite of the, of the um, school of Atum Ray. All right? Now, he left southern China for India to re redefine and spread the teachings of the counter-religion to Hinduism called Buddhism. All right? Now, Atum Ray, the Tamil people was the followers of Atum Ray, but they also, Atum Ray is also Puttare, or Tare, and Puttare. 
All right, Pata is where the word Buddha comes from. You do your research on that. All right, you get Gerald Massey's book, Ancient Egypt, The Light of the World, Volume 1 and 2. He tells you in there also, he tells you in Gerald Massey's lectures. You can get his other books, Books of Beginnings, Volume 1 and 2, also Natural Genesis, Volume 1 and 2. All right, so these particular books will help you grasp the concept of where these religions, these world religions, all stem from, and the source is ancient Egypt, Kemet, in which that Egypt was a colony of Abyssinia or Kush or Ethiopia or Somalia, as is now known as moderately. All right, the name Egypt and Ethiopia come both the word of uh, Kiap and Egypt, which both means uh, um, Egypto, in which that both means burnt face. And these was supposedly Greek Roman words or Greco Roman words or Greek words. All right, so um, you have to understand that. So this is why we take it back further to um, to Mary. If you get the Black Man of the Nile by Dr. Ben Yakinen, Yusuf Ben Yakinen, he states in it that the, the um, oldest name for Egypt is Tamari, T-A, which means land, earth, and Mary, M-E-R-R-Y, spelled also M-E-R-I, which means beloved or throne. All right, so that's what that symbolizes. Mary was also another name for Osset, which is Isis. So hence in the Bible, um, Osset's name is dropped off, and her other name, Mary, is kept in which that she becomes Mary, the mother of Jesus, which Jesus is Heru. So hence you have the Black Madonna and Child statue throughout the 200 countries of the portrait, the statuettes, as well as also of the paintings throughout the um, various cultures um, and religions, um, in particular of the Christian religions um, of the world. So... Uh, we know that Buddhism is from Pata, the, um, the followers of Pata, and it was transformed into Buddhism, which became a religion, which the word religion originally came from the Latin word religo, which means to bind back or to tie back. What is this bind or tying back to? It's the same as word yoga, or yoga, which means the union, to link oneself back to once your higher self. That's what that's symbolic to. So the word religion is not essentially bad. It's just what you link yourself back to. You should be linking yourself back to your higher self. So Buddhism was a religion founded on the teachings, as we know of Siddhartha um, Gautama, um, who taught the Four Noble Truths to enlightenment, as well as also the Eightfold Path of Buddha. All right? Now, these are basically the same principles of, um, of the laws of Mayat and the universal principles of Tahuti. While often portrayed um, as Asian, we know that the uh, Buddha was a black, you know, man. You know, according to um, Sir Gumphrey Higgins, an 18th century um, English scholar of ancient culture, he produced a, a two-volume work published in 1836 titled um, Anacliptius. All right, um, an inquiry into the origin of languages, nations, and religions. And in his research, he revealed that the following passages that in the most ancient temples scattered throughout Asia, um, where um, where Buddha is worshipped, he is yet continued. He is found black as jet, with flat face, thick lips, and curly hair of the Negro. Today we awaken to the fact that the Buddha's tightly curled knots of hair and elongated earlobes are unmistakable African cultural tradition. There are not snails that protect his holiness from the rays of the um, sun, which this is what was claimed by some researchers. But um, actually, um, they are the extended earlobes, which symbolizes a sign of wisdom. In other words, um, an individual who listens in order to gain knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, overstanding, understanding. 
and as such, scholars and early martial artists instructors used to teach. All right, so um, at the temple known as the Shaolin um, in China, Bodhidharma prescribed a set of exercises and movements to keep the monks healthy and awake during martial arts. Those exercises, those movements, became known as Qigong. This is why at the top of the hour, um, toward the beginning of this conversation, we played Qigong by um, Wu-Tang producer and MC RZA. And if you go and find the video um, on YouTube, you will see O'King, um, he'll actually say in the video that there's nothing more important than Qigong. Qigong is everything. So this is what Bodhidharma gave to them, was a set of exercises and movement to keep the monks healthy and awake during meditation. These movements and breath exercises, I might add, um, um, of Qigong became known as the 18 Hands of Lohan and formed the basis of the, Chilin, of the um, Chinese Shaolin Kung Fu, all right? And later, the Japanese Karate, although it must be noted that the indigenous um, I knew it on the island of the present-day um, Hokkaido, uh, Hokkaido um, Japan contributes significantly in the transmission of the martial arts to those islands. All right. I had to put that in there because um, most people don't know about the ancient um, Ainu um, people of Japan. They are blacks, Moors, as we would say. Now, the Buddhist philosophy, which is derived from the ancient um, Tamarian, maintained that maintains that the exercises and the self-defense skills were designed to preserve the body. And this is true because once the body was preserved, it can, it could master, and it could be mastered and utilized to unlock the spiritual centers within, and provide a pathway towards the liberation of the soul without. This is what this is. This is why martial arts was developed. In other words, it was mas- It was mastered so that you can. It, w- it was used to master the reptilian portion of the brain through discipline, because. Most individuals, as we said last week on the show about those who have who are psychopaths or sociopaths and those who have the tendencies of of the um psychopaths and sociopaths, they have no discipline, so it was through discipline in which that you had to master the reptilian portion of the brain in which that would help you know, which was utilized to unlock the spiritual centers. Not just within this, what's known as the seven Elohims or the seven souls of Ra, known as the seven um, abodes of light, also referred to as the seven churches, the seven centers, the seven melanin centers, the seven chakras. All right, all of this is symbolic. It's talking about those particular endocrine glands. You have seven major endocrine glands in your body the pineal gland, pituitary gland, the thyroid gland. Thymus gland, your pancreas, spleen, um, the uterus, and the clitoris, or the ovaries within the woman, within the male, the prostate gland, and the testes. All right? So, these are the major glands in the body, and at the nucleus, or at the nestle of these nerve fibers and endings, um, there's a light in which that is emitted, in which that symbolizes Roy G. Biv. All right? These lights are superimposed, or these um, states of consciousness are superimposed upon these endocrine glands, in which that basically deals with memory. This is what these endocrine glands symbolizes as memory containers, in which that produces hormones from these ductless glands in order to keep your body in rhythm and in tune and to keep your body healthy. So this is what martial arts was for. Now, in addition to the um, traditions, the African origin of martial arts and the way they transform lives can be found in the very names of some of the disciplines or the um, disciplines themselves, all right, such as um, karate, 
you know, as a modern day martial artist. Um, you may have been told that in um the Japanese language karate do translate to mean um empty hand way. All right. However, karat means empty and ta or te translate to mean hand. And the word do in Chinese, you know, a thou means way. Now this is correct. However, let us look at a um a far older use for this term karate. And when you break down the word karate down you um into the um most ancient Egyptian words or the metoneta, you got ka, ra, and te. Now ka in the ancient um, Tamarian or Kemetic or Egyptian language has a double meaning dealing with the spirit, true, and the physical. Now ka in the um Tamarian or Kemetic language basically means the vital energy of the soul. Or the soul, you know, it's been translated to but it means spirit. All right, which also symbolizes the breath. All right, you go to Webster's Dictionary, when you look up the word spirit, you will find the word synonymous or the synonym breath. And when you look up the word breath, you will find um, the word spirit. They're both synonymous. They are, um, they both um, are the same. So when people say, oh, you're into that spiritual shit, yes, I must breathe. I breathe. This is the understanding um, in the ancient time is that when you talk about spiritual information, the spiritual, you're talking about the science of breath. So the ka is often described simply as um, the double body or the body double, which does not convey its understanding as the spirit or the subtle vital energy. However, the Egyptian idea of a vital energy, ka, is much, um, is very much like the li in Japanese or ki. And in China, the um, the chi, all right? Now, of course, in the Sanskrit of the um, Hindu Kush people, the Tamils, known now as the Dravidians or the Untouchables or the Sutras, um, it is known as prana. Now, another definition of ka um, is the body, or more precisely, the dead or empty body, as in the mummy. All right, and then of course you got cos, and then of course you got ra or res, which within ancient Kemet means to wake up or to raise up or to keep awake or to watch. Ra is also the name um, given to the sun, all right, as the sun god Ra, um, which renews itself by circling to reappear. In fact, you will find that the prefix re or ra in many words in the English definition points to comedic origin, such as radiation, radiation, auric, or aura, excuse me, all right? Radio, in other words, words in which that deals with transmissions and with energy and currency or light, um, oftentimes have the word ra or ray um, embedded inside of it. Now, why would Egyptian words show up in the English language? Well, many of them are. There's many. The word mother is from moot hair. M-U-T-H-E-R. Moot hair is where we get the word mother from. H-O-T-H-E-R. It's from M-U-T-H-E-R. Moot hair. Moot hair. Mother. This is the origin. The word pata, pata ra, pata re, is where we get the word father from. P T A H R E is where we get F A T H E R. The word cousin comes from the word kunsu. C H O N S U is how we get C O U S I N. Da het heru becomes the word daughter. D A H E T H E R become D A um, U um, G H T E R daughter. All right. The word um, another name for Newt is Anut. Anut becomes the word aunt. A N U T become aunt. 
A U N T. So even the very words that we use within the family structure and the nucleus of the family on the extended version of the family are all comedic words. Showing and proving that the Egyptians were here in the Americas. And of course, we can go to Arizona, to the Grand Canyon, and prove that there's 18 temples there in which that um, have metuneta or hieroglyphics and temple names of Egyptians or the ancient Egyptians or the Temerians. All right? So this is because the early settlers of a European land uh, revered the ancient Egyptian symbols of the cross also known as the Ankh. They named their land Ankh land, which over time became England. Okay? So um, the English language has a lot of the words coming from Egypt. This is why you can go to the British Museum today and find your history all up and down the halls and on the walls. And in statue form. Matter of fact, as soon as you walk into the British Museum in London, you will see statues over 50 feet tall, in which that was on the Giza Plateau at one time. Now it's in the British Museum in London, calling themselves preserving your history. But anyway, we got the Ka and the Ra. Now we got the T, a Ta, which is the um, comedic. Um, or which means hand. It also symbolizes land, ta and t. Now, in the ancient comedic uh, writing system, the metonetic, the symbols for t is, uh, means out of, to go out or to emit or to give, to set, to place. So do not look at the fact that the metonetic, other words as the hieroglyphics, a Greek you know, term meaning writing of the gods. For t is an illustration of a hand. And that in Japanese, the word T is also um, the word for hand. Okay? Now, the, um, I think the most compelling evidence for the direct interaction between Egypt and Japan are found in a wonderful detailed painting on the walls of the Temple of Prince um, um, Kemenhotep II. I think it's from the 12th dynasty. It depicts a group who were known as um, the Amu. There's um, eight men, four women, and three children are depicted. And they are led by a royal scribe, Neferhotep, who is holding a papyrus roll on a paper um, roll that announces a total of 37 Amu who arrived bringing coal or I paint as a tribute to Prince um, Kim Ho, um, Kamenhotep II, and the Amu are described as Asiatics. They are light-complected people wearing clothes of bright colors, bright patterns of colors. Um, I think the men are all heavy beard. Um, these Amu visitors are not depicted as bond um, captives, but instead carry weapons such as bows and arrows, throwing sticks and clubs. Now, the Amu are the ancient ancestors of the indigenous people of modern Japan known as the Anu people. Now, in the language of the Anu, uh, their name means human. Now, in their daily life, they pray to and perform various ceremonies to the gods whom they call Kamu. Now, the ancient Egyptians referred to themselves as the Kamu people or the Kamau people. Now, the Anu aboriginals of the indigenous people of Japan are heavily bearded, and they have thick, wavy hair. Their brightly colored clothes are almost identical to the patterns of the clothes worn by the Amu in ancient Egypt or Temeria. Now, the language of the um, moderate Amu um, or the Anu reveals further connections to Kemet. Now, the, ancient, now the, um, the word Wika means to raise livestock. 
The word risu means to uh, raise a child. Words like reek and reeky means to go up, to ascend, and high. All right, we have already explored the Egyptian term and concept of ra, re, and res. Same words. Now, the um, Dainu um, have another word called teak, meaning hand. Also worthy of note is the Anu word of Yukaru or Yukara, which originally meant to imitate or to mimic. The Akaru was said to um, represent epic poems believed to be the voice of the gods who was described describing their own ceremonies. Now, the Anu always told their Yukara in the first person and would always end with the words, so say the gods. All right. Now, as we understand the term karate do in the moderate sense to mean um, empty hand way, now we, um, you know, from that, you know, from the original um, Metunata language, the terms karate, along with the existing philosophy of Mayat and Tahuti, and the process of raising the Kuntalini, or also known as the Aritu, or the Aritu. There was there's seven Aritus, or the seven lions, or the seven souls of Ra. And I'm translate more accurately to reflect the concept of the liberation of the soul or the spirit from the body. All right, the Kaaba. Hence, within Arabic, you have the Kaaba. The Kaaba is what um, millions of Muslims go around, or thousands and you know, thousands and millions of Muslims over the years have gone around um, in Mecca, which symbolizes um, the birthplace or the source of information um, for the Arab world in which that uh, supposedly was built by, the area was supposedly was built by Abraham and his son Isaac or Ishmael, all right? in which that um, symbolizes thousands of Muslims during the time of, I think it was during the time of Ramadan, um, they would go around the Kaaba seven times, symbolic to the activation of each chakra being opened and activated. And then on the last turn, they would go to the corner and kiss the black stone, symbolic to the pineal gland um, being activated. So hence the Kaaba, um, the spiritual soul being awakened, all right? And that is through the liberation and the rise of the Kundalini energy, all right? So for the ancient Egyptians, this led to enlightenment and resurrection. This is what is known as the rebirth or being born again in Christianity. This is what this is really talking about. The Greeks, um, whom we know studied these arts and sciences, um, sciences in Egypt, named their martial arts, um, um, I think it was called Pan uh, Pan Karashan. All right, which they define as Pan meaning all and Karat meaning powers. All right, so all powers. Now, a more accurate definition that I have arrived, you know, uh, at regarding the term Karate is that Karate, in the original sense of the word. Um, means the way to bring forth or to draw out the power or the essence of the spirit. Now, the ancient Egyptians knew that the spiritual body was much more powerful than the limited uh, physical body. The entire system and culture, traditions, were devo- devoted to the pursuit of knowledge and wisdom and understanding and spiritual enlightenment. You know, you know this was just like within yoga, the study and the movements of the martial arts were originally intended to be used as a key to unlock um, the latent potential uh, force within each and every one of us so that the spirit could raise up, you know. So so if so, the few hundred years of moderate martial arts practice that is marked by um, commercialism or craft commercialism may have um, very little to do with the traditions that is many thousands of years older. You know, so it could mean that the martial arts today are certainly not being practiced for the purpose they were intended. 
all right? And this is not being told to most martial artists. When you watch um, MMA, um, you're seeing um, ego. Just simply competition. For press, for win, for, you know, for um, advertisement, you know, simply to say who's the best. But where is the real science at here? You know, what what further support our spiritual agenda for the practice of karate is the fact that in um, the ancient comedic language, karate, not surprisingly, can also be written as the same word as caress, which means Christ, which means to be anointed or to or to be risen. Now, did Jesus' spirit not raise up, according to the Bible, from a dead? Um, from a dead body to become the Christ? Is this not what we call the resurrection or the raising from the dead? So stop and think about that. That's what that is all talking about, you know, for you, you know, you know Christian Bible thumpers. This is this is the science. So if it's going to be explained, Marshall is going to be explained properly by Christians. It must incorporate these ancient teachings coming from Egypt because all of the religions of the world stem from that. All right? So, this has to be overstood. You know, so, that's the science of martial arts is to live your life like it's golden, praying and worshiping the God in me. In other words, each and every one of us have our own God or deity or higher self, on which that we must acknowledge on a daily basis through thought, through tongue, which is speech, through actions, words, and deeds, as we would say. Um, so we must acknowledge that. And so let's continue on. So now let's look at the reference in, um, I think it's in um, Genesis, the 32nd chapter, the 22nd verse. It's like in reference, actually, in a sense, to martial arts, because Jacob wrestled with the angel, all right, on which that was called... Um, with a man, and um, according to the, uh, I guess you can say the the Kabbalic um, encyclopedia, the Kabbalistic encyclopedia uh, by David Godwin, that particular angel was Uriel, which symbolized the lower self or Lucifer. So Jacob means the supplanter anyway in Hebrew. And then he wrestled with his lower nature, you know, his Kundalini energy, his Luciferian nature, in order to raise that energy up to become Christos or Christ or Kares, Karate, all right? He wrestled with this man for one full day, and then Jacob rose up and was victorious, and his name was changed from Jacob to Israel, which means to ascend to God all right, in Hebrew, all right? So he reached a place called Pineal or Pineal. Right? And symbolic, which is the third eye of wisdom. And he had his name changed from Jacob to Israel to reflect his complete insight to the comedic principles represented by the female principle Isis and the male principle Ra and the divine El or the divinity El. So hence Israel. Now, this is what, you know, this is all symbolic. Of course, we know that these are. Um, Fictional characters, allegories, these stories are allegories. However, the principles are there, not as just for moral um, explanation, but also for spiritual enlightenment. Because if you notice, there's a moral to each story in which that is being told in the Bible for man not to go down the wrong track. You know, like for example, let's say, let's look at um, Adam and Eve. Instead of Adam being responsible and being accountable for his own deeds and actions, he told God, well, you know, you gave me her. You gave me her. In other words, when Eve gave him that fruit in order to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, instead of being accountable for his own actions, he blamed God and tried to blame God and say, well, you gave it to me. So that was denial. You know, and it wasn't just denial. It was him being uncountable for his actions, and he didn't know, and, that was, and he was irresponsible. That means that was what lost our godhood, 
when we become irresponsible and we're not being accountable for our deeds and ways and actions, then we lose our godhood and we go into a, a state of denial, self-denial. And this is what causes um, us to be relegated to the reptilian portion of the brain and to develop um, psychopathic, sociopathic tendencies. And this is what that story was showing you. All right? So um, let's look at another story. Like, for example, uh, it is said that Jesus, um, who many, you know, believe studied in Egypt during his lost years, his 18 years, you know, from the age of 12 to the age of 30, those 18 missing years, of course, you can find that within um, the Moore Science Temple, um, what is known as the Circle Seven. Also, you can find it within the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus Christ. And um, the 18 Missing Years of Jesus, there's another book in which that all claims that, all right, um, all of the people in the Bible went into Egypt. Abraham went into Egypt with him and his family, um, all right, uh, Jeremiah sojourned in Egypt, Moses went into Egypt and learned of the Egyptians for 40, um, for 40 years and learned all the ways of the ancient Egyptians, all right, now uh, matter of fact, I think he, he was there, um, for more than 40 years, all right. Um, so all of the so-called prophets, uh, when they had to get taught, they went into Egypt. So even though Egypt was symbolic to the lower self, because remember, Egypt had two. Um, you had lower Egypt and upper Egypt, which was both symbolic to the lower self and the higher self, or to Set and to Heru. And then the Pharaoh or the Nagu or the Naga, uh, Pharaoh or Pharisees or uh, emperor, empresses, or empress, who can come and unify both um, the red lower Egypt and the white upper Egypt, um, unify those crowns. They were master of the land. All right. So this is what this is symbolic to. So Jesus supposed to have went there, and of course. Um, he symbolized the risen Christ. All right, the life of Jesus parallels that of um, another crucified Savior and resembles closely in words and deeds. And, of course, who is that? That is um, Krishna, Buddha, Hiru. Um, as a matter of fact, um, the word Christ, coming from the word um, Roman, Latin word Christos, means the black one. All right, Buddha means the black one. Krishna means the black one. All right? So um, this is what all of this is actually talking about. So um, every age produces an ascendant master such as a Christ or Krishna or Buddha or benevolent warrior priest, you know, such as um, Prince um, Amenhet, as um, we was talking about from the 12th dynasty in Egypt, or Kemet, Tamaray. And it's almost certain that during um, our modern era, the martial sciences in the West will lead to a few practitioners if not more, to similar levels of insight and achievement. All right? So in um, Africa today, despite um, her many problems, there can still be found masters and warrior priests of the high spiritual orders among the Dogons of Mali, um, the Ifi, um, or the Ifa of um, Nigeria, the Zulu of the um, South Africa, and other African people. The traditional martial arts are still being practiced, and especially within um, Brazil, you know, as well as here um, in South, um, South America, as well as here within the States and all around the world, you know. So um, this is what we're talking about, and these are the understanding, overstanding, and understandings that we have to come to when we are um, talking about these particular schools of thought. All right, we're going to try to go here and see what's going, what's being talked on. Let me see. Um, are there any questions in the chat room, anything in which that anyone want me to go over 
or Bill Moreland. And if there's any calls, um, please raise your hand, and we'll um, we'll bring you right on in. All right, we went over a lot of information, a lot of good books. All right. Um, let me mention some more books in which that um, will help with that information. African Origin of Civilization by um, Shekhant Diop, in which that he speaks about the fact of that there was a priesthood in Egypt in which that left um, in the B.C. time, around 500 B.C. E. or before the Christian era, in which that he states that um, many of these priests went out and wished that formed these particular schools of thought and which that becomes the major world religions today. He goes on to even explain further that um, that around 500 BCE was around the time when the Greeks um, began their philosophy when the Jews or the Hebrews, Israelites, right of um, the particular prophets in which that came, such as Jeremiah, as well as also um, Zoaster, Buddha. All of them came around that same time period. The particular schools were being formed. So there was an exodus of Egypt around 500 BCE in which that these priests went out into the diaspora, went out into the world in which that um, formed these particular schools of thoughts and religions in which that now millions of people practice on a daily basis. Are there any martial arts um, related? This this is a question in the chat room. Um, are there any martial arts more closely related to the Montu arts or encompasses more of the ancient teachings? Well, um, I would look up um, um, Brother, um, who's doing the African martial arts. There's several brothers who's doing the African martial arts right now who is um, attempting to resurrect these particular teachings. All right. Kalendi Ihi is um, one of the um, masters who is um, bringing this information out. And I will recommend um, getting his um, African martial arts DVDs. You might be able to see some of it on YouTube. And you can see some of the ancient moderate skills taught today. And, of course, um, you know, in Brazil, um, you have capoeira, in which that um, supposedly originated from the slaves it looks like, in a sense, a form of break dancing slash monkey style of kung fu, um, you know. So you can, you know, those that system was combined in order to um, be utilized. And uh, I mean, so there's many. So there is no um, encompass of the original teachings. Um, all of these things have now for for better or worse, have become embedded within our DNA, our genes. And upon any type of practice of martial arts, when we begin to become thorough within just one form of martial arts, we can actually branch off and form our own um, school of thought. And, of course, the most well-rounded martial artist is one who learns many styles and become thorough within many styles. So not so we're talking about from... Um, judo, grappling, wrestling, to um, gujuru, to um, nujitsu, you know, to aikido, qigong, tai chi, you know, these various arts, you know, um, mastered over years. Because you know that normally it takes between two to four years to become a black belt within any system. 
All right? And, of course, if you practice, you know, for hours on end every day, then you will show thyself approved. All right? So those would be the original teachings because it would come out of you. And, of course, you can develop your own system after you um, master um, those particular styles. Yes, I've seen the Indian art of the Kalari um, Payat. Um, yes, once again, Hindu Kush people, the Tamils, um, the people in which that um, also develop um, their form of um, arts. And we have to um, look at all of this. All of this is, you know, is connected. And this is the part, this is the point of me going into the martial arts being of African origin, you know, um, is because it seems when we do uh, martial arts, we do it from a um, Asian standpoint, you know, and that is fine. They are the ones in which that kept um, the sciences and the arts going, you know. However, um, look and go and analyze the information was that we went over tonight, and you can develop your own style based off of the temples, like we said, of um, Amenhet, you know, um, the Temple of Ramesses, and these various temples in which that actually have been found to have the Nuba wrestling and the various um, Montu arts on the walls. And you can actually look at these drawings and begin to study. Because if you notice, most of the Kung Fu movies, or a lot of Kung Fu movies, when they show you the way in which that the student um, practices, um, the student just don't learn from the teacher. They also have to look through manuals and to learn the stance, to learn the foot position, to learn um, the various exercises and breathing methods. All right? And this information was passed down um, through the bloodline or from lineage to lineage, you know, from um, master to student. You know, we have to begin to develop the same information. We have to. De um, we have to. We have to. We have no choice. All right, so this is the um, science of what is going on. And um, let me see if we got any questions yet. All right, no questions yet. All right, we're going to be waiting for you all to come on and ask some questions in a minute here. Still don't have no questions yet on the on the, um, on the the line, so um, we're going to get back into um, the chat room because that's where they're building at. And, um, oh, yes, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, uh, wrote that on my phone that it came from your own mind when you learned the basics. Exactly, because your mind, remember, we are a concentration of seven generations on our mother's side and seven generations on our father's side, so we are a concentration of their thoughts and memories embodied, hence your genes, your DNA. So that is the mind of not just you, but also of your ancestral line, all right? And so it comes through your ancestry, and all the information that we talk about, this is why history is important and why Elijah Muhammad and many others knew that um, history um, rewards all research is because um, in history you find a pride, a self-assent, self, self-worth, self self-love. It comes through history, through knowing who you are, all right? So this is what the purpose of tonight's um, information was about and is about. So that you can know. Of course, you know, we, you know, sometimes I'm preaching to the choir because we got many brothers and sisters out here who know quite a bit of information and have a bit of knowledge, you know. But what we're trying to do is encapsulize all of that information and bring it to you through via um, radio, and so um, you can play this back for your for for your ancestors, you know, or from your you know for your ascent, you know. For your um, seeds, you know, <laughs> you know, 
you know, so um, that that is definitely, you know, the science. All right. Um, let me see here. Let's go to. All right. Now nah, no one's still on the line. All right. Um, any other things y'all want to build on in the chat room? I'm going to get back to you in a second, Brother Blackbones, <laughs> with that info. All right. Um, let's see what else we can build on, y'all. You know, we went over quite a bit of info. Hopefully, you know, people are getting it and they're enjoying it. Um, well, I was asked the question what I think about um, Bruce Lee's art, uh, Jack Kundu. Um Kun, of course, is... You know, to me, it's short for Kundalini, or Kundalini. You know, which that symbolizes the um, the raising and the master. You know, mastering of that energy in which that we talk about. You know, that energy at the base of the spine is six thousand degrees um, in temperature. You know, and when it raises up, it actually can emit over two million um, degrees, and but yet not consume the body. So, hence, your body actually is the burning bush. And so I think in the understanding, overstanding, understanding of what um, Bruce Lee was teaching, he was basically teaching free form, you know, um, take the Wing Chun, take boxing, take wrestling, grappling holes, and judo, and combined it all and to a system in which that, you know, he say it flows like water, be like water, my friend. So he wanted something that was fluid, fluidic. And I don't blame him because a lot of times, a lot of the forms are too rigid. You know, like, for example, karate is a rigid form of martial arts. Punch, 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 kick, kick, punch, kick, you know, roundhouse, kick, you know. I mean, so, I mean, wanted something in which that was moving, you know, something in which that was, you know, the body itself is fluidic. You're 75% water. Your brain is 90% water. Your blood is 90% water. Your spinal column is 85% water. So you are an aquatic being. So, yes, be like water, my friend. I agree with Brother um, Bruce Lee, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, and the reason why he was killed is because he was teaching um, the Ethereum or the you know, or how to move the etheric body, you know, to the Europeans, the Albions. Not because he was teaching it to um, his black students or more students, such as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And he had another student. His first, Actually, his first student was a brother, which I cannot remember his name right now. But, um, you know, he, you know, um, taught this information. You know, so you know this 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 information was fine when he was teaching it to us. They did not somewhat. I can't, I can't say that they somewhat had a problem with it because the word Li within um, Chinese means black. So <laughs> it's just like it goes back to the Shang Li Dynasty, which was the third dynasty, in which that came from out of um, the Shango or from out of. Um, and if you go and look at the Shang Li dynasty, you will see that they are um, predominantly Negroid in features. You know, so um, not only was the first dynasty, Shang dynasty, black, but so was the third dynasty in China, um, black also. All right? But they went specifically by the name, the Shang Li. So this Li bloodline is where um, Bruce Lee, Jet Li, all of these Lees um, come from. Okay? And this is, and you know, and it is alleged that the word, you know, the word Lee means black. So, you know, this this is what is really going on. You know, just like um, the word quasi corto, corto within uh, Mexican, uh, Mexico, throughout the Mexico region, um, Cucucan, um, Vercasha, um the plume serpent, all of that is talking about the Kundalini energy, but 
um, predominantly is talking about that melanin, that energy, that li, or the koto, you know, symbolizes that black, that black substance, that black energy, symbolizing, uh, once again, that melanin, that fluid, you know. Uh, so, I mean, we have to understand uh, what, you know, they're talking about here, you know, because, um, right, you know, we're talking about the Dragon Society and the Phoenix Society, um, you know, these were, you know, said um, black um, Chinese, you know, as we would say. And as we sh- already did and told you at the beginning of the show that these black Chinese actually were the Kong people, all right? The Kong people still exist in southern central Africa today, known as the Kong people. Hence, you have the word Kung Fu, all right, or Qigong, all right, Kong. Kong means to cultivate. Hence, energy cultivation, you know, comes from Kundalini, Kong. Once again, that energy, that, that Kundalini energy to cultivate, to develop. So this is what all of this is really talking about here, you know. Right, right, um, Star Child, we already um, broke that down early on, the Shi people, um, in which that this is where the Shang Li and the um, Shang Dynasty comes from is from the Omex or the Xi people, um, and you have the um, Xi'an Providence where those pyramids are built at in China, which that we spoke about earlier, in which that you know the so-called you know Chinese people you know who are there now moderately um, state that they did not build because um, they was built by these Africans or these African Chinese as they was called you know misnomer you know we'll just say the Xi people you know so this is what you know, um, we're talking about here, right, with Afros. Um, of course, you go to Vietnam, um, Taiwan, the Philippines, Malaysia, uh, you will find, you know, um, blacks throughout that whole region. As a matter of fact, you had the um, yard people in Viet- Vietnam who lived up in the mountainous regions, and if you notice, um, Matter of fact, one of the brothers who was in Vietnam was often told by the Vietnamese people that we are sane, we're sane, we're sane, pointing to them and to the blacks. And they kept telling them that blacks, this is not your war. Go home. Oftentimes, um, my brother would tell me stories of he waking up after, you know, he'd been smoking weed all night long, you know, getting blitz. You know what I'm saying? Um He's knocked out, you know, up under the tree, you know, sleep, survived, and the white guy who was on the back of the tree, Gus is hanging out, slaughtered, dead. And a sign is near him saying, you know, black man, go home. So, I mean, there's so many instances of this happening, you know. Um, oh, the um, techniques um, that was in the avatar of the last airbender, uh, that was Tai Chi and Qigong. That was what we was talking about earlier. All right, that's what we was talking about earlier. All right, the mastering of air, water, fire, earth, as well as also, which is all combined, is ether. All right, so um, once you master air, fire, earth, and water, you've mastered the four principles, and that's what you do in Qigong. Um, you know, and Tai Chi. Qigong is the art in which that we spoke about earlier that was brought um, to the Shaolin Temple by Bodhidharma. Bodhidharma was the Tamil, a follower of the um, Atun Ray school of thought from out of Egypt, um, a Kushite. Hence the term Kushite or the Indo Kush Mountains. And he brought the information into Asia, into China, um, to the Shaolin Temple, in which that he taught these particular breathing exercises and body movements to them as a form of exercise to maintain health and to be and to stay awake during meditation. So they was moving meditation um stance and postures. And this is what was known as Qigong. And then when you which was mostly hand movements and arms movements, you know more upper body than lower body. Then you add Tai Chi into it, which you add more 
of the lower body into it in order to blend it out. And then from that, you get, of course, the observation of looking at the animals, the five animal styles uh, from out of the Lohan 18 hand system and Han system. And then, of course, you learn the five animal styles. And, then of course, this becomes the basics of Kung Fu, um, of Shaolin Kung Fu. And then, of course, this spreads into, um, you know, the Orient. And, of course, um, you know, um, if that's the case, then we have the fact that China slash Japan and Russia have an interest in Iran. And I don't know if the United States think they're just going to go in and beat up on Iran and no one is going to chastise them for doing so. I don't think that's going to be the case. So, um, you know, if that if if this is what they're doing, um, they're going to um lead to this is going to lead to World War Three, um, possibly. All right, and you know, and um, this this is what you know is possibly could happen. Now, as far as this um the UFOs and Lord Maitreya, um, if you say he's not getting media attention, well, actually he did. He his commercials was all over CNN, um. C-SPAN, A&E, History Channel, National Geographic, Sci-Fi, about a year ago, a year and a half ago, um, after Obama got into office, November all the way into um, February, and probably even further in some other um, states, his commercial was all over the air, in which that they were contributing, seeing UFOs and all these lights in the air, and he was contributing it to Lord Maitreya. And they were commercial with something like this. If you have seen these lights, they are contributed to one man and one man alone. He is the world teacher, Lord Maitreya. And basically, of course, you know, when you look at Lord Maitreya, you know, he is uh, the individual who claims to be the fifth Buddha. Um, the ninth incarnation of Vishnu, the Mahadi, the Christ, or the return of Jesus. And he's claiming all of these titles. And so he's claiming that all these UFOs, Benjamin Cream is claiming that all these, or Share International, is claiming that all these UFO activities that are now occurring is based on him and him alone. You know? And, you know, so... They're working all these things out. It is no coincidence that all this is happening, you know, at the same time. You know, it's accumulating at the same time. You know, World War Three, UFO invasion, or talks of rumors of wars, as we say, wars and rumors of wars. Um, Iran is a rumor of war. Um, the war, of course, is um, Iraq and, of course, um, Afghanistan and um, Pakistan, partially and and then Syria, you know, in which they even, and they even talks of going into um, um, Africa, you know. So we know that, you know, in particular, and I think it was in Uganda. So these wars are rumors of wars. This is what goes back to Matthew, the 24th chapter, you know, in the book of Revelation. So this is what all this is talking about. And what these people are trying to do is play out these particular stories in the Bible, they're using the Bible as the play script. This is why we have to get our minds from out of the Bible literally and a, and a historical book and see it more as a science book slash metaphysical, esoteric, allegorical book and see how it applies to you physically, you know, and spiritually, you know, something internal and not external. And the things in which that happens externally, we won't fall for. Because right now, they're trying to um, fake and do a whole lot of things, you know, and we will fall for it if we keep putting our eyes, you know, if, as, they, as they say, taking the eyes off the prize. The prize is your higher self, you know. Remember, this is a spiritual war. The battle is for your mind, your soul, your psyche. That's why it's called mind control or programming of the mind, programs. They use the TV. All right, so anything in which that you are able to tap into becomes a programming 
So just, you know, thank your higher self that you are not locked under a programming as your mothers and brothers and sisters and fathers might be. You know, you made it. You have unlocked that um, particular paradigm, and you are now traveling beyond. And so this is what we need to be thankful for, you know, um, in that sense. So the science is master self, and you won't have to worry about what's going on externally. What's going on externally will only scare the hell out of you and make you fearful and stop your progression because it will keep you locked in the reptilian portion of your brain. And this is what they want because they fear the return of the gods and goddesses, the natural rules. They fear us, the return of the um, serpents of wisdom, the nagas. They fear us. We are returning. We are here. And so they have to lock the minds down through fear, through panic, through terror. And hence anyone who um, know this information are terrorists on terror, earth. So this is what is going on. So don't fall for that um, bullshit, you know, which that is going on um, out there. Because, um, you know, we got a lot. We got the, we, people who um, are seeing double suns. You know, a lot of the solar flag activity is jumping off greenhouse, global warming. Um, you know, these solar flare activities are taking place significantly right now. We got the chemtrails on which that is dropping, and they're still putting up in the skies. Um, we got the harp system, you know, and other weather modification of mind control weaponry, electropulse beam weaponry. We got the programming on TV, programming on the cell phones, programming on the computer, programming on the um, on the TVs, you know, uh, radios, you know, I mean, this is a battle for your mind. So you have to stay, um, you have to stay centered. You know, I'm exactly star child. You have to stay centered, you know, and focus on our development, exactly. And um, we, we have to master it. Right. You have to be peace amidst the storm. You know, you have to. So this is what is going on. All right. And so, um, oh, yeah, yeah. Their weather mods can't keep, can't keep up anymore, exactly. No doubt. You know, so there's a lot of information going on. And so we have to, this is why these, why we're doing these blog talk radio shows that, in order to um, help those who might be borderline conscious, as we would say. They're straddling the fence. They got one foot in Christianity and one foot in metaphysics, you know, esoteric teachings, and they don't know which way to go or whatever the case may be, whatever religion that they might be caught up in right now. We're trying to bring them into um, full awareness and enlightenment through what we call metaphysics or quantum physics or, you know, whatever term that we want to call it because quantum physics means to leap beyond and metaphysics means to go beyond the physical. They both mean the same thing. Is that one is seen as a pseudoscience, but yet they use all the metaphysical teachings to explain their quantum physics. Most of the scientists, if you don't know, are Rosicrucians. A lot of them are Rosicrucians. So they get a lot of their ideas and principles from the Rosicrucians, which is based on metaphysics, but yet they use it within their science. Who do you think Einstein was? Einstein was a Rosicrucian. You know, Sigmund Freud was a Rosicrucian. All right? You know, so these, these um, you, know, you, you have to understand who you're dealing with. You know, so their um, greatest quantum physicists, you know, um, all of these individuals are Rosicrucians at um, high degrees. And so um, they are using these um, sciences and these teachings, and they're giving it back to the people. You know, as um, you know, as real science, but yet calling quantum physics as pseudoscience. Right? Exactly. Bum, um, Einstein. Exactly. Tesla was the shit. No doubt. Tesla was definitely was on it. But Tesla also was a spiritualist. You know, um, hence a student of Rosicrucian doctrine. And the best um, minds are part of those particular schools of thought, in which that helps take the mind beyond just the. Um, the nonsense, which is nothing more than indigenous moral science, you know, 
all of it, you know, the Rosicrucians, the Knights Templar, uh, Sufism, Masonry, that is more science. And they, you know, do their perverted things up in there, but um, the teachings are ours, and you can always find where the um, information goes. All right, it goes back to us every time. All right, we'll be getting ready to go. We appreciate y'all, and we out. Peace. First World Order Radio, finally, finally, we are on the air. No doubt. All right, all right. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. We get on into some of that order consciousness tonight. First World Order Radio every Wednesday, 8 p.m. We got to talk about what is taking place on the planet. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. First, we need to let you know we're going to be doing more shows, giving out more information on Wednesdays. Wednesday is 8 o'clock. We are now going to make this is the hottest day of the week. Seen in others in time, order, importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. Proceed in others in time, order, importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. You need to understand how magical this, uh, something like this every Wednesday can become. So you need to start uh, getting your calendar right, get your schedule, your schedule right. You need to know our intention straight out. All right, so I mean, these clues are given throughout the various languages was to piece the puzzle of this ancient mystery school back together again. And what we plan on doing, both of us, is bringing y'all some surefire dynamite. We're going to take this level up a notch. We're going to have stuff to do here. This is not just going to be about philosophies and theories and shit that works.